Thank you. Portfolio questions. Question one, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Lothian regarding GP services in Musselburgh. NH, uh, NHS 24 are delivering a pilot at the Riverside GP practice in Musselburgh, whereby they are triaging patients who have requested same-day GP appointments. Where appropriate, NHS 24 will signpost patients to other areas of the primary care system, which are better placed to meet their needs and offer more swiftly. Indications are that this pilot is working well, with a number of patients signposted to more appropriate support, freeing up GPs to deal with patients with more complex needs. A full evaluation is underway with a report due in the coming weeks, which will be shared with health boards and integration authorities. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. Earlier this month, 200 angry Musselburgh residents turned out at a public meeting because they've had real and persistent difficulties accessing GPs locally. They don't think it's working that well, Health Secretary. Many of these problems are caused by a GP shortage, a point that both the practice and the BMA acknowledge. So can the Cabinet Secretary explain to my constituents why they have to phone NHS 24 to see their GP and when she expects Scotland's GP shortage to be resolved? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, the pilot that NHS 24 are running uh, has been a system that has worked well elsewhere and has had really strong evaluation. So I would urge Kezia Dugdale to wait for the formal evaluation of the pilot. I'm happy for her to be furnished with the evaluation if she would be interested in that. In terms of the, uh, the way forward in, uh, for general practice, she will be aware of the new contract that has uh, been put in place with substantial resources to back that up. We will invest £100 million in this financial year to support the new contract. And we also, of course, have the ambition to uh, increase the number of GPs by at least 800 over the next 10 years. But in addition to that, will be that multidisciplinary team to make sure we can reduce the workload of GPs. Miles Briggs, briefly. Thank you. Musselboro residents, as Kezia Dugdale has outlined, are complaining of long waits, often half an hour just to get through on the phone, Cabinet Secretary, and then waits of around three weeks before they're even seen by a GP. Does she think that's acceptable? Cabinet Secretary. No, I, I don't think it's acceptable, but I think it's important that we try new uh, ways of working, and the NHS 24 system has worked well in other areas and has been well received by patients. Now, if there are issues with the way uh, this pilot is working in Musselboro, that needs to be picked up by the evaluation. But more generally, Miles Briggs will know that the work around the expansion of the primary care team and the new GP contract and the increase in uh, GPs over the next 10 years is all about making sure that we reduce the workload of GPs so that they can spend more time with the patients they need to. That requires a multidisciplinary team and that is going to take a bit of, bit of time to put in place. Question two, Daniel Johnson. Ask the Scottish Government what the average waiting time has been in the last year for adults seeking diagnosis for ADHD and how many rejected referrals for diagnosis there have been. Minister. The data on waiting times for psychological therapies is collected by Information Services Division Scotland. The data is gathered in an aggregate form from NHS boards and does not allow waiting times and rejected referrals for adults with an ADHD diagnosis to be separately analysed. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for that answer, but I think it's regrettable we don't capture this data because it's critical so that people can be directed to the right specialists. It's a bit like not knowing whether or not people are being referred to oncology or for orthopaedics and physical health. And indeed, anecdotally... No, I'm I want your question, please. Uh, so can the, the, the government uh, explain uh, what they're going to do to capture this information so that people can be directed more effectively in mental health services? Minister. Uh, well, as I said in my previous answer, this information is not collected at the moment, but we are looking into this and are in discussion with ISD Scotland on how we can move this forward. Question three, Stuart Stevens. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to meet the oral health needs of an ageing population. Cabinet Secretary. In January, we published Scotland's Oral Health Improvement Plan, which includes actions to ensure older people receive appropriate oral health care. One of our priorities is to introduce a new domiciliary care service. For adults, including older patients, the plan also includes an action to introduce an oral health risk assessment. This will ensure that the dentist is able to offer tailored advice to older people on how to look after their oral health and minimise any risk of dental disease, including oral cancer. 
Stuart Stevens. Uh, what discussions has the Scottish Government had with the UK Government to include dentists in the proposed uh, visa uh, cap scheme, in particular given that uh, there are large numbers of EU nationals operating as dentists in the North East of Scotland whose future in the service might be at threat? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, the member is quite right to point to the number of EU nationals working in, not just in the northeast of Scotland, but particularly in Dumfries and Galloway uh, as dentists due to previous successful <coughs> recruitment campaigns. And I would be very concerned to lose any of them from Scotland. In terms of last week's announcement uh, confirming that doctors and nurses are to be excluded from the cap on uh, skilled worker visas under tier two of the immigration rules uh, from the, the 6th of July. While this is welcome, uh, we uh, need to see the detail. Uh, it may be that it increases the capacity for other applications from, uh, from uh, outside the health professions, but obviously dentists are not directly covered, but it is something that we would want to take up uh, with the UK government, and we will be seeking further detail on that in the coming weeks. Nassar, briefly. I uh, note our register of, of interest that I am a former practicing dentist and my wife is still a practicing dentist. Uh, the Health Secretary will be aware that the BDA have raised concerns about the new oral health action plan and the risk that may have in more patients turning to private plans like DenPlan as a result. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what assessment has been made of the number of patients going to DenPlan and would she agree to meet with me and a delegation from both the BDA and practicing dentists to discuss this further? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have uh, discussed this with the, the, the BDA and uh, opportunities that I have engaged with dentists. Uh, they have raised uh, both positive uh, issues about the new plan and some of the concerns that Anna Sarwar has raised. Um, I mean, first of all, as he will understand, this is about an appropriate risk assessment. And the whole idea here is to make sure that dentists can spend more time with those with the poorest oral health. And that means that the appropriateness of the plan is, is, uh, is dependent on the person's oral health. Now, that's something I would hope that we can all agree on. But in terms of the implementation, it is important that the chief dental officer uh, and others continues to engage. And I'm, I will continue to engage with the BDA and others to reassure them on those issues that they've raised. Question four, Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Fife regarding the withdrawal of primary care emergency services from St Andrews and what action it will take to ensure that the town is considered as an option for future service provision. Cabinet Secretary. Well, my officials have been in regular contact yeah. with Fife Health and Social Care Partnerships during the contingency period for primary care out of hours service in Fife. But a provision of safe and sustainable out of hours service uh, is the responsibility of NHS Fife in collaboration with the Health and Social Care Partnership. And I understand the partnership will shortly be consulting on the future of the out of hours service across Fife. The review, including an options appraisal, has been in development for some time in response to the recommendations of Sir Lewis Ritchie's report on out of hours in Scotland, published at the end of 2015. Willie Rennie. Does the Health Secretary understand the level of anger and frustration that there is in the whole of North East Fife? St Andrews Community Hospital is not even an option in the consultation that she just talked about for primary care emergency services consultation. Even though local GPs have offered to support a local solution in North East Fife. So will the Health Secretary intervene to make sure that it is considered as an option so that the whole of Fife can get the service that it deserves. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, as I said, my officials are in regular uh, contact with the, the partnership, and I do understand that the partnership are continuing discussions with uh, GP colleagues in North East Fife regarding the future of the out of hours service and their potential uh, contribution. And I've certainly asked to be kept informed of those discussions as they're taken forward. Liz Smith, briefly. And does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Professor Sally Mapstone, who is the Principal of St Andrews University and her senior officers, who argued at the recent public meeting that Mr Rennie's just referred to, that the large percentage share of students in the town creates a unique demography, which in itself is reason to treat St Andrews as a special case when it comes to the provision of medical services? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, obviously, in taking forward uh, this, these proposals, they will have to look at the, the whole of the area, uh, including St Andrews and the provision of there. And I would expect them to take into account the demographics and the population, including the, the student population that Liz Smith refers to. All of that should be uh, looked at, and I will uh, make that point uh, um, in, um, that Liz Smith has raised uh, to officials to pass on to the partnership from this this uh, question time. Thank you. Question five, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to fill vacancies at NHS Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. NHS Scotland boards are required to have the correct staff in place to meet the needs of the service and ensure high quality patient care. The Scottish Government works closely with boards to support their efforts in staff recruitment. The Scottish Government remains fully committed to a sustainable NHS and its workforce, which continues to deliver consistently high quality healthcare services to the people of Scotland, including in Dumfries and Galloway. Dumfries and Galloway are currently exploring a number of options to meet the continuing recruitment challenges, particularly in relation to medical staffing. The board has reported that it's made a number of recent offers of appointment and that further targeted recruitment activity is planned. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary realise that in NHS Dumfries and Galloway, the vacancy rate for pharmacists is 28.4%, for consultants it's 22.1%. The, 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 the bill for locums is an eye-watering £12.6 million a year because they can't fill vacancies. Newton Stewart and Moffat Hospital have just had to cut the number of beds by a third because there's a shortage of nurses. The Health Board have reported... They no, I need a question, please, now, Mr I'm Smith. asking the, the Cabinet Secretary if she's aware of all these things. Thank you. Is she, Cabinet Secretary. Is she aware? Or is no, it, is thank it? you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, uh, of course, and that's why in my initial answer I referred to the recruitment uh, campaign that Dumfries and Galloway is undertaking and uh, that is something we're supporting them in doing and I would hope that as part of our international campaign which I announced just this week that Dumfries and Galloway will be part of that to help to fill key specialties that are very difficult to fill here. Briefly, Emma Harper. Very brief to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taken to grow our NHS workforce across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the workforce has increased by over 10% under this government to historically high levels, and it has risen by almost 500 in the past year alone to nearly 140,000. And because we have more posts, that sometimes does impact on the vacancy level, but that's something we're determined to address. Finlay Carson. In 2015, we saw GP recruitment and retention programme only recruit 18 doctors at a cost of 2.5 million, and none in Dumfries and Galloway. Only this month, with announcement of yet another similar scheme, this Health Secretary has been trying these schemes since 2015 and they seem to be failing. Does she not agree that fresh ideas for recruitment in rural areas are Cab urgently needed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, if you have any, they would be gladly received, um, but the ones that we have have been uh, based on an, uh, the evidence base uh, of, of how to recruit very, very uh, difficult uh, recruitment uh, uh, of GPs anywhere, not just in Scotland, but those incentives have proven uh, to attract uh, GPs. Uh, we want to do more of that, and of course, as I said, the international recruitment campaign that we have launched this week will look at the key specialties, and I'm sure general practice this will be one of those. Question six, John Meese. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether Parkhead should be the location for a new health and social care hub for the east end of Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. The decision on the location of the new health and social care hub is a matter for local determination by Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership in consultation with local stakeholders. I expect the initial agreement to be submitted to the NHS Capital Investment Group for discussion at its next meeting in August. Before any final decision is made, I expect the partnership to carry out a site options appraisal. This will be an open and transparent process as required by the Scottish Capital Investment Manual. John Mason. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and I accept that the decision will and should be made locally, but will she at least accept that the transport links to Parkhead are much, much better eh, for public transport especially than to the likes of Lightburn and other sites and Parkhead is by far the best eh, option? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, uh, full marks for John Mason for trying, but uh, as I said, I expect the Health and Social Care Partnership to engage fully with the local community before coming uh, to a conclusion. All of the issues that John Mason raised, including transport links, uh, deprivation, and of course an analysis of the best uh, site will all be taken into account. And once a short list of options has been agreed, then further engagement will take place. Question seven, Jamie Green. 
To ask the Scottish Government what action NHS Ayrshire and Iron has taken to tackle its gender pay gap. Cabinet Secretary. NHS Ayrshire and Iron's latest published gender pay gap information shows a male to female pay gap of 2.84% for NHS Agenda for Change staff overall and 4.63% within its consultant cohort. Each health board has published its own gender pay gap data and this is not collated centrally across the whole of the NHS Scotland. However, the figures for NHS Ayrshire and Iron compare favourably with the full-time gender pay gap in Scotland, which was 6.6% last year, compared to a UK-wide gap of 9.1%. Jamie Green. Uh, the reality in Ayrshire is that at Cross House Hospital, uh, there's an average of £35,000 pay gap between male and female consultants, with men earning a staggering 61% more than their female counterparts. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she's going to bring forward any new proposals or indeed strategies to address the reasons why there are such huge variations in pay gap between genders in our NHS? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government has taken clear steps to promote to NHS Scotland as a modern, inclusive and diverse employer and is supportive of all measures to promote women in strategic leadership roles and deliver a more equal workforce, including tackling uh, the pay gap. Uh, as NHS staff receive NHS pay rates and the rate for the job, uh, uh, and although this is the same rate for male and female workers, evidence for a gender pay gap is sometimes quoted as average earnings, but that, of course, does not take into account hours worked and any allowances accrued, and the gender pay ga gap at this grade reflects the fact that, historically, there were very few female consultants in NHS Scotland due to child care and career breaks but this is slowly changing with the uh, most specialties report that between 30 and 60 percent of females in post in the middle grade of trainees that means that they, when these doctors finish training the percentage of female consultants will increase across NHS Scotland and I think well, that will help to close the pay gap. Question 8 James Kelly. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that GP appointments are available in a timely manner. Cabinet Secretary. The new GP contract backed by uh, investment of £110 million in 2018-19 will ensure that GPs can spend more time with patients when they really need to see them, as well as developing multi, wider multidisciplinary teams to support GPs and improve patient care. We're also working to increase the number of GPs by at least 800 over 10 years to ensure a sustainable service that meets increasing demand. James Kelly. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Uh, lack of GP appointments is a constant issue across the region. Uh, one woman from Blantyre recently raised an issue with me where it was going to take more than three weeks to be allocated uh, an appointment. Uh, I've raised this issue with the Cabinet Secretary in writing and I'm still waiting for a reply ten weeks down the line. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary when she'll reply to the issue raised on behalf of of my constituent and also what specific thank you thank you cabinet specific, secretary what specific action is cabinet taking secretary to address please the GP crisis? mr kelly cabinet secretary uh, well as i outlined in my initial answer the level of investment and the new gp contract in the primary care plan and the uh, the ambition to increase uh, the number of gps by at least 800 over the next 10 years uh, shows the, the plans we have to expand uh, primary care. However, in terms of the reply, I will chase the reply to James Kelly's uh, question and make sure that he gets that as quickly as possible. Question nine, Linda Fabian. To ask the Scottish Government how it is progressing the distress brief intervention pilot. Minister. The distress brief intervention uh, went live in June 2017, initially in Lanarkshire only, with the other pilot areas in Aberdeen, Scottish Borders and Inverness going live in October 7, 2017. The pilot is being hosted and led for the Scottish Government by North and South Lanarkshire Health and Social Care Partnerships and is progressing well. Linda Fabiani. Uh, can I uh, ask the Minister to recognise what a sensible scheme this is, with local public agencies in Lanarkshire having a responsibility to do early intervention if people are seriously distressed, and um, also to recognise that this is well worth training all staff and public agencies on this kind of early intervention. Minister. 
Uh, well, uh, can I thank uh, Linda Fabiani for her interest in the pilot, which is in her area, and also for hosting the parliamentary reception for the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership, uh, who had a worldwide week of collaboration in Scotland to learn about the DBI, uh, and which they were very impressed about and were hoping to replicate in their own countries. Thank you. Question 10, Jackson Carlaw. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it can provide an update on the inquiry by Professor Alison Britton into the review of mesh implants and when it expects the findings to be published. Cabinet Secretary. I understand that Professor Britton's review is progressing, but as it has been carried out independently of the Scottish Government, the precise detail, including publication date of her final report, is a matter for Professor Britton and her team. Jackson Carlow. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in paying tribute to Michelle McDougall, a brave soul who recently died of cancer and was tragically unable to receive chemotherapy due to the debilitating consequences of faulty mesh devices implanted into her groin and ab abdomen years earlier? And in view of the national, indeed international, attention and importance of Professor Britton's review, will the Cabinet Secretary agree now to a full parliamentary debate in the autumn when the report is published and on the wider developing issues now associated with mesh? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I join with Jackson Carlow in paying a tribute to Michelle uh, McDougall? Um, and can I be, try to be helpful to Jackson Carlow by saying, uh, of course, uh, when Professor Britton uh, produces her report, I will be happy to bring that back uh, to Parliament in uh, whatever form is appropriate. As I said, I don't know the time scale for that, but we'll have to allow Professor Britton to continue and conclude uh, her work in due course. Neil Finlay. President officer, I was at Michelle's uh, very uh, moving and quite inspiring funeral. Uh, can I say that the Mesh women who attended, uh, their resolve is greater than ever. And uh, I would remind the Chamber that 101 members of this Parliament called for no whitewash uh, of the Mesh report. So we'll be watching that very, very carefully. And I hope that debate happens very early in government time in that new session. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said, it will be down to Professor Britton to determine when her report is, is published. And of course, it will be her report. But of course, as I said to Jackson Carlow, I will be happy uh, to uh, make sure that Parliament is given the, the time and opportunity to discuss that report. Question 11, Emma Harper. Ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work of the Respiratory Improvement Task Force. And I remind Chamber I'm the convener of the Cross Party Group for Lung Health. Cabinet Secretary. Officials are working closely with the recently appointed chair of the Respiratory Task and Finish Group and key partners to finalise the constitution of the group, set out the objectives, including required work streams, to develop a plan for respiratory care for Scotland. Emma Harper. This week is Pulmonary Rehabilitation Week and PR is one of the most powerful and cost-effective interventions for people living with COPD and other lung diseases, allowing people to self-manage and stay out of hospital. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore outline what action the Government will take to ensure that every person who would benefit from pulmonary rehab gets access to a programme? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, the Scottish Government recognises that pulmonary rehabilitation is an important element of respiratory disease care. It has a well-established evidence base for its benefit in helping to support self-management and reduce exacerbation in hospital admissions. It is a key recommendation in the national clinical guidelines, which we expect boards to follow. And access to pulmonary rehabilitation will form an important part of our quality improvement plan for Scotland. And I'm pleased to advise that the Scottish Government is funding participation in the national asthma and COPD audit programme which will collect data on the provision of pulmonary rehabilitation across Scotland and that will be a valuable tool in improving the care and outcomes for people in Scotland living with COPD. Question 12, Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what priority it gives to suicide prevention. Minister. Mental health and suicide prevention are an absolute priority for the Scottish Government. Over the past several years, we have been working with a wide range of partners to tackle suicide. The suicide rate has fallen by 17% over the last decade. Before recess, we will be publishing the new Suicide Prevention Action Plan, which will be designed to continue this long-term downward trend. Emma Harper. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian Whittle. No, clear. clear. Oh, I beg your pardon, I'm all guddled up here. Claire Adamson, Miss Adamson, my apologies. Thank you, presiding officer. The minister will be aware of particular circumstances in my own constituency when a, young, a number of young men have taken their lives, leaving their families and their friends and the wider community devastated. 
My own staff are undergoing Safe Talk training and last year I myself undertook ASSIST training. What opportunities are there for young people across um, to access these training services across our communities in Scotland? Minister. Um, every life matters and every death by suicide is a tragedy and everyone has a role to play in suicide prevention. NHS Health Scotland provide a range of training on suicide prevention. We are committed to continuing support for the mental health, first aid and suicide prevention training. And the new Suicide Prevention Action Plan will be published, as I said, before recess and is supported by an extra three million over the next three years to support innovative work on suicide prevention. Strangely enough, Mr Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to, to ask the, the Minister if she's aware of uh, Chris Boy's charity, which was formed after the tragic death of his brother, and their approach to encourage those suffering to come forward and discuss their issues and break down that stigma, stigma associated with mental health. I wonder if she recognises that approach and also the importance of peer-to-peer -peer work in the prevention of suicide. Minister. Um, I thank Brian Footle for his question. Yes, I am uh, aware of um, the Chris Boyd uh, Trust and um, absolutely there are a wide range of interventions. Peer support is absolutely crucial and I'm very keen that in the Suicide Prevention Action Plan that peer support for families and relatives who have been bereaved by suicide are given the support they need. Thank you. Question 13, David Stewart. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government which NHS boards offer the Freestyle Libra glucose monitoring system. Uh, Minister. Thank you. Uh, currently, seven NHS boards in Scotland have included Freestyle Libra sensors in their local formulary. NHS Borders, NHS Forth Valley, NHS Lothian, NHS Dumfries and Galloway, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, NHS Lanarkshire and NHS Ayrshire and Arran. David Stewart. Presiding officer, if Freestyle Libra is good enough for patients in Edinburgh, why not for patients in Inverness? Minister. Well, there is, um, of course, he knows that there is, um, it's up to NHS boards to determine what uh, is available based on the best clinical evidence. There is still a bit of work to be done around the clinical evidence, and that will allow, um, once that's established, that will allow NHS boards to uh, work out how they best support patients with type 1 diabetes in their a local uh, NHS board. But I'll continue to keep the uh, um, member uh, updated uh, as we uh, expect the Scottish Health Technology Group to publish their advice statement, which will enable uh, health boards to take an informed decision on that. Jenny Gilruth. Can the Minister outline when the Scottish Health Technologies Group will report on the long-term clinical evidence of Freestyle Libre, as I understand some boards, including Fife, will be waiting to make local decisions based on these findings? Minister. Jenny Glorouth is absolutely right, and that's why I said what I did to David Stewart around the evidence that's required for NHS boards to make and establish their own decision on this. And we expect the Scottish Health Technology Group to publish their advice statement in July 2018. Question 14, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the NHS policy is on accessing IVF treatment by couples. Minister. Couples must meet certain eligibility criteria before being referred by either primary or secondary care providers for NHS IVF treatment. Eligibility criteria and provision for NHS IVF has changed on a number of occasions over the last few years following recommendations from the National Infertility Group, always with a view to improving the service for the majority of patients and improving outcomes for babies born following IVF treatment. I'm pleased that Scotland has one of the most generous provisions of NHS IVF treatment in the UK. Richard Lyle. Thank the Minister for her answer. My constituents have un been unsuccessful twice in treatment. We're told that they could get a third attempt, but Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board maintain that my constituents are not entitled. Will the Minister meet with me and my constituents to discuss what can only be described as an outrageous situation for them? Minister. Um, if, uh Mr Lyle's constituents were referred from primary or secondary care for NHS IVF treatment after the 1st of April 2017, then they should have been considered for a third cycle of treatment. If the constituents were referred before the 1st of April, then unfortunately they are not eligible to be considered for a third cycle of treatment. But I am disappointed to hear that Mr Lyle's constituents were given conflicting advice about whether they were eligible for further treatment, especially when it relates to something as emotional as that for belonging to start a family. 
So I will ask the Health Board to investigate this uh, serious issue uh, and meet with Mr Lyle and his constituents. And of course, I uh, am always uh, happy to meet with Mr Lyle to hear about his uh, concerns directly around this case. Question 15, Ivan McKee. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the provision of health services in deprived areas. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring there is adequate provision of health and social care services across all areas of Scotland. It's worth noting that the new GP contract is designed to support areas with higher levels of deprivation. Decisions on the level of provision required are a matter for local determination. Ivan McKee. The East End of Glasgow contains an extremely high proportion of Scotland's most deprived communities, so it's good news that Lightburn Hospital was saved and that health services in the area are to be enhanced. I'll be conducting my own survey of constituents over Your the summer question, to ascertain please, Mr. McKee. local views on the scope and shape of local services. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that full public consultation is essential to ensure the East End gets the services it deserves in the best locations, including the Lightburn site, if appropriate? Uh, Cabinet well, Secretary. As I said earlier on to, to John Mason, it is important that there's full consultation, that there's full analysis uh, and that there's a, a, a full site options appraisal. Uh, that's a, an open and transparent process as required by the Capital Investment Manual and that is what should happen in the East End of Glasgow. Question 16, Christina McKelvey. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank Cabinet Secretary for that? Recently, a meeting with NHS Lanarkshire, I raised the issue of the withdrawal of phlebotomy services from GP practices in Stonehouse. NHS Lanarkshire had no knowledge of this, but ensured that the nurses got access to accommodation to continue this much needed service in Stonehouse Hospital. Can the Cabinet Secretary discuss with NHS Lanarkshire at a future meeting the need to improve communication with GP practices, especially when there are significant changes to services available at the practices? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, uh, as part of the development of uh, the primary care improvement plans, which need to take place in every area to implement the new GP contract, integration authorities should liaise with their local GP community around changes to services. And my officials are engaging with NHS Lanarkshire in this process, and I'm happy to write to Christina McKelvey on this matter in the near future. Question 17, Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the NHS supports the health and well-being of prisoners in HM Prison Edinburgh. Minister. NHS Lothian is responsible for the delivery of health care in HMP Edinburgh. The health care in HMP Edinburgh provides primary care, mental health and addictions trained nurses who provide for the ongoing health needs of the patients in the prison environment. There is also access to visiting specialists, including psychiatry, psycho psychology and dentistry, and patients have access to a full range of secondary services. Gordon MacDonald. Thank the Minister for that answer. Sockton Prison in my constituency has had a substantial increase in prisoners self-harming to 74 cases in the last year. What action is being taken to specifically address self-harming in prisons? Minister. Um, I thank... Uh, um, the member for raising this important issue and of course the Scottish Government always takes mental and emotional well-being of people in prison incredibly seriously and that's why Action 15 of the Mental Health Strategy taken forward by Maureen Watt commits the Government to increase access to mental health workforce by 800 additional staff in key, set key settings including in prisons. Uh, the Scottish Prison Service is committed to ensuring that those in their care who are experiencing distress and who are at risk of self-harm have access to the support they need, including from NHS Lothian and other partners. Uh, the Scottish Prison Service uh, ensures that staff are fully equipped to promote an, a supportive environment where people in prison can ask for help and all prison establishment staff are trained in suicide prevention and the SPS supports Scottish mental health first aid uh, training. Again, though, I'm happy to meet with the member if he would like to discuss it further so we can uh, ensure that we're doing all that we can to support the very vulnerable people in the prison that he represents. Thank you. Question 18, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the value of the talks by the Teenage Cancer Trust to make young people aware of the signs and symptoms of cancer and how it ensures that local authorities encourage schools to hold such talks. Cabinet Secretary. 
The Scottish Government supports the Teenage Cancer Trust's work in delivering vital awareness and education sessions in secondary schools. I'm encouraged that 80 per cent of schools in Scotland have already received an awareness session from the charity this academic year alone. I'm even more heartened to see that the figure is 100 per cent in my own constituency of Dundee. I've written to all MSPs asking them to engage their relevant local authorities to encourage schools in their catchment area to welcome this cancer education programme. Rona Mackay. Thank like the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Does the Minister agree with me that promoting these talks in our schools should be a priority in helping improve survival rates of young people in Scotland with cancer? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I absolutely agree with the member that educating our young people on the possible signs and symptoms of cancer at an early age is of vital importance, not only for their own well-being, but also in their role as influencers on older adults within their family circle. In the year of young people, it's timely that we acknowledge that we need to equip our young people with the skills and information they need to know about the, the benefits of, of good health uh, and also when they might need to seek medical advice. Question 19, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce delayed discharge at NHS borders. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scottish Government officials are meeting senior officers from the partnership uh, today, in fact, and will continue to work closely with them to reduce the level of delays. A range of improvement measures have already been put in place, which has led to a reduction of over 30% in bed days lost between November 2017 and April 2018. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, ISD statistics have revealed that NHS borders lost on average 1,000 bed days a month over the last two years, which is just not good enough. What will the Scottish Government do to help rural boards um, like NHS borders to ensure that when a patient is fit to leave, they can? Cabinet Secretary. So at the April census, 10 partnerships recorded standard delays over three days in single figures. The worst four partnerships accounted for 43% of the total delays. So it's really important that we focus particularly on those partnerships. The Borders Partnership has introduced a range of measures aimed at reducing delays. This included an 850,000 investment in a step down intermediate care facility and the development of a, a hospital to home reablement service. The reablement service was initially piloted in two localities and this led to a 40 per cent de decrease in long-term care requirements. The partnership now plans to roll the service out across the area with increased AHP input. I think that will make a real impact on reducing bed days lost further. Question 20, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to tackle the reported high levels of COPD in the Stranraer area and whether this will include the installation of new air monitoring equipment. Minister. Thank you. Uh, we know that Scotland has high rates of COPD and this is why we are working with our clinical experts and key partners such as the British Lung Foundation, Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland to develop a respiratory health plan for Scotland. This plan will include key priorities of prevention, diagnosis, treatment and research of respiratory conditions including COPD and will build on the work of the COPD Best Practice Guide published in November last year. And it's my understanding that under the 1985 Environment Act, local authorities have a duty to designate areas where air quality objectives are not being met as air quality management areas. There are currently no air quality management areas identified within Dumfries and Galloway that will be kept under review to ensure we're, 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 we make the most efficient use of limited resources such as our networks of high precision and real-time air quality monitors by focusing our attention on areas of concern. Finlay Carson. Thank the Minister for that response. As the Minister may be aware, Stranraer doesn't only have the highest levels of CP COPD in Scotland, it's the highest levels in the world. An interreg project called Breath is currently investigating the reasons behind uh, this uh, high incidence. Can the Scottish Government uh, outline how it may help uh, the Breathe project uh, uh, establish a centre of excellence in Stranraer? Minister. Uh, again, and, and I recognise the interest that the member takes on, uh, in this, and I'm aware of the, the Breath um, uh, programme that he outlined. Uh, the Scotland participates in the Interag BA programme, the cross-border programme 2014-2020 uh, with uh, Northern Ireland and the border region of Ireland. Uh, and this eligible uh, areas of, for Scotland are regions in the West Isles and the West of Scotland. So, of course, we'll keep an, a real interest in this project and this programme as it uh, progresses to make sure that we can stand to get the best evidence about how much more we can do to help support people in particular areas where there's high incidence of COPD uh, and ensure that we recognise the learning that can be got from things like that uh, to enable us to tackle it across the country. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions. I have a short pause before we move on to the next item of business. <laughs>